And so God bless uh, you today for that. We welcome you. We're glad to see you here. I want to jump into the Word because I have a goal today. I'm excited about giving you this uh, message today, and I have a I have a, a goal to get this done. I'm been watching some of my messages that are recorded online and they just have been a little a little about a little too long and so I have a goal to get this done in 30 minutes and give or take five minutes and uh, basically give five minutes you know I don't know or take five which are what it is that you say but look with me in your Bible if you will I'm going to read some verses you you, you might want to just look at Psalm 105 I'm going to start in Genesis 39 reading a verse but we're going to spend most of our time in Psalm 105 and then, uh, hopefully, if I get time, we're going to get to, to a passage in Acts uh, 27 that we'll look at uh, as well. But I want to read you this. You don't have to turn there. This is the story of Joseph. And even Psalm 105, when we read it, it's going to be talking about Joseph, the patriarch. And Joseph had a dream that one day his brothers and his, even his mother and father would bow down to him. And he shared that dream. And the brothers were already jealous. That just sent them even in more jealousy. And so one day when he went to check on them, they decided they were going to kill him. But the way they said it was uh, very revealing. Genesis 37 and verse 19. Here Joseph is coming to them, and this is what they say. They said, look, this dreamer is coming. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit. And we shall say some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. I mean, just think about it. Let's kill the dreamer that's coming and see what will become of his dreams. Most of you know your Bible uh, pretty well to know the story of Joseph. If you don't, you need to go back and read these last chapters of Genesis, one of the greatest stories in the Bible. But now I want you to look over to Psalm 105, if you're there, that's good. I want to read to you in, in Psalm 105, and I'm going to read from, get my pages here to it, get my exact verses to it. We've been in Psalm 105 for a lot of things. I'm going to look down to verse 16, Psalm 105 and verse 16. Moreover, he called for a famine in the land. That's God. God called for a famine in the land. He destroyed all the provisions of bread. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They heard his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons until the time that his word came to pass. So until the time his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the people let him go free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions to bind his princes at his pleasure and teach his elders wisdom. Go back to that verse 19. Until the time that his word came to pass. I got a brilliant sermon title today. Until the until. Until the until. I had the wonderful privilege of growing up in one of the most beautiful parts of our country in East Tennessee, and my house was just a small walk down to the mighty Tennessee River that was dammed up by the TVA system, uh, and so it was Lake Chickamauga right there where I grew up, a big lake part of the river, and I had some great experiences there. I'm going to tell a story about it. Some of you long-term members have heard this story, but some of you new ones happened, and it perfectly illustrates what I want to talk about. But I was a young teenager, and me and my good friend Tommy Marsh at that time got to spend the whole summer together. It was kind of the summer before I went to work. I've been working ever since, but this was the last fun summer, you know, just to go out as a kid and do things on the lake. And he and I got a bright idea one day that we wanted to do something we had never done before, and that is we decided to go sailing. We had a little skiff with a single sail in it, and we decided we're going to take this out and try this sailing thing. Now, you got to understand, my dad... And when it came, he didn't care for sailing. And when it came to, you know, boats, he said, why do all that work when you can just put some gas in one and throw the throttles to it, you know, and go? And uh, I'll tell you what, I was original redneck. I'm telling you, my dad took our houseboat. If it had an engine in it, my dad said it could go faster. And he took our houseboat, twin 350 engines, put turbochargers on them, put trim tab on the back, propped it just right. And I'm telling you, it outrun anything on the lake. And you think that's nothing, but you'd be out there in a fishing boat 
tricked out fishing boat cruising down the river and here comes a 36 foot houseboat just blowing your doors off beside you and it'll get your attention you know I mean it, it's the engines well we decided we want to go sailing let's try this sailing thing let's just do it so we decided to get out there and do it and and we were in a, a marina that was in the perfect what we called slough off of the main channel of the Tennessee River because it had a real narrow opening and then it opened up inside so you could get all these boats and boathouses and sailboats and everything in there and they were protected from the wind and the waves of the main channel of the Tennessee River. So he and I paddled our way out to the front of that and right as we got past the, the little narrow opening and out into the main channel, the wind was blowing and it was blowing upriver. We hoisted that sail and I mean that little skiff got to going. We, got, we were just having the time of our life. This, I, boy, this sailing stuff's easy. And uh, we've just been having a good time. I don't know when the thought dawned on either one of us, but somewhere way upriver, the thought hit us, how are we going to get back? You know, the wind's all blowing this way. Now, what are we going to do? We thought about taking the boat to the side of the river and walking along the bank and pulling it all the way back. And I thought, that's stupid. We, we'll never get back in time to do that. Well, what we, we kept trial and error, trial and error, trial and error. And finally, we learned something. We learned that if we went diagonally across the lake, into the wind, we could make a little progress and then turn and go diagonally again against the wind and, and we'd make a little more progress. And by the time, hours and hours later, that we were getting closer, we were getting pretty good at it. We were making some time and when we got over to the mouth, we, we had to paddle to get inside the, the, the marina again. And man, when we got in that marina, oh my goodness, sunburned, you know, totally exhausted. Um, you know, I was thirstier than I'd ever been in my entire life, I think. And we got in there, and I said, I'm never sailing again. And I don't think I've ever been on a sailboat since then, you know, and doing that. It was just too hard. What, were we, what, what, what did we learn on that trip? What we did was we learned to use the winds when they're contrary against us to make progress. Anybody can go down wind. I mean, you know, it's easy. The wind just blows you that way. But how do you go against the weather when it's contrary against you? What do you do then? You know, that's a, that's a life lesson that you learn, that you have to learn in life. And I think all graduates hear it at their graduation ceremony from whoever the speaker is or whatever. And we know that you just have to learn that in life sometimes because everything don't go for you. But what's a, an important lesson in life in general is essential to learn in the Christian experience. Absolutely essential to learn I mean, just remind you how it works so it real something and I'm talking to people in the kingdom I'm talking about those of us that God has brought into the kingdom we've been saved we've been born again we know God and when we do there's there's a something that happens in our life and here's what happens it's real simple God speaks in our lives and gives us purpose he gives us a dream he gives us a vision whatever word you want to talk about it. but God deposits in us what our purpose is what we're supposed to be doing and then before that purpose, that dream is fulfilled, we go through some time and troubles along the way. Some of you are sitting here today and you've got a dream that you've been dreaming for a long time and it, it hadn't been fulfilled uh, yet, but you know it will be and you're still in that process of waiting to see it fulfilled. I wish God would give us a purpose and then zap us and it was done the next day. It doesn't work that way, does it? So we see those three things. God gives it. It's tested, and then it's fulfilled. Now, I want you to understand something about that process. That's not just about you. You're going to see this in this, this text today. It's not just about you. Dream fulfillment, word fulfillment, purpose fulfillment, with prayer and promises from God and getting to that fulfillment is not just about you. God's doing something bigger than you are. Because when it gets fulfilled, you do something that you can only do in this life. And that is show the world that God indeed is real. He answers prayer. He fulfills dreams. He fulfills the assignment that I've been on. He gets me there. And it's the greatest way that God, you know, will reveal himself to people so that they can understand that, that, that wonderful truth that, that he does these things. Now, I read about Joseph. I read back in Genesis that actually tells us the story of Joseph. And then 
I've read here where in Psalm 105, which is a great psalm of praise, and most likely they used it in their festival gatherings, and it was a way for them in a, in a poetic way or a singing way to rehearse their history as Israel. And so it's written in almost poetic way, but it's the Word of God, and it, it tells us so much about what Joseph went through from the time he had the dream and all the stuff he went through, and then it was fulfilled. Matter of fact, everywhere in the Bible, those three things are illustrated by people's lives over and over and over and again. And in the wisdom literature of the Old Testament and the epistles of the New Testament, it's taught by precept. It's everywhere in the Bible. God speaks, we believe, obey, and we go through a process of that which is precious being tested until finally it's fulfilled. You find it everywhere in Scripture. Joseph is probably the one that we see it more than anybody else. I mean, Joseph is going to his brothers. He's had this dream, and they said, let's kill him. And they were going to kill him. Reuben, one brother, had a little bit of righteousness in him, said, no, 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 let's not kill him. Let's just put him in a pit, and then we'll sell him to slavery. And so they sell him into slavery. He goes down there. He rises to the top everywhere he's at, ends up in Potiphar's house, and he gets accused of sexual harassment erroneously. It was not true, but he gets thrown in prison for it. By the way, just kind of throw this in there. He was a convicted felon by an unjust trial, and the Bible's full of them. Just thought I'd throw that in there for what it's worth, you know. It really is. The Bible's full of them everywhere. And so he's in prison. He rises to the top of the prison. But then he interprets some dreams, and, and once again, the butler and the baker, you know, and one of them, he tells them his dream, he's going to get out of prison, and, and you need to remember me when you do. He forgot him until later. So, I mean, Joseph's had a tough life. But then the day comes when he's brought out, and just as the Scripture says here in Psalm 105, Pharaoh really makes him the number two in the land, and he arises, and the bigger purpose is the famine that God has sent now. He brings his brothers down, and they're reunited, and he, and he makes that famous, famous statement. This is, this is what it's about, Genesis 50, verse 20. I read it to you exactly. But as for you, talking about his brothers, you meant it evil to get rid of me, to sell me into slavery. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good in order to bring about as it is this day to save many people alive. So God's, his dream was not just about him. It was about the future of Israel. It was about the future of the world that was in a huge famine. And God did all of that to prepare him for the fulfillment of that dream. And it wasn't just about Joseph. It was about God's bigger plans that are there. Look at Psalm 105 with me. And let's just walk through it for a minute here. And then I want to give you five dream stealers that are, that are out there that we need to be aware of today and, and have courage to resist. He, he, it starts in verse 16 of Psalm 105. He called for a famine in the land. But, you know, just remember, our God is sovereign. You know, the devil's not his enemy. You, God can't have an enemy. He's God. The devil's our enemy, you know, today. But, but listen, in a sense, God is sovereign. He's working his plans out as he sees fit everywhere. He called for the famine. God called for a famine that threatened almost the world's existence at that time in all that area where Egypt was the superpower for sure. So God called for that. It starts with that famine. It starts with them doing that. But look what it, it goes on to say here. Wherever he called for a famine that land, he destroyed the provision of bread. Verse 17, he sent a man before him, before them. He sent a man, it says there, before them. God is at work in your difficulties. So God gives you a word. And I mean, he said, all I got was a dream that was going to be great one day. And now I'm a, I'm a slave. And by the way, look, look at this passage right here. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They made him a slave, but God was sending him. Oh, the big difference there. Don't look at your life according to what man says or the circumstances. Look at your life according to what God says about you. He was not a slave. He was a man on a mission sent by God. And God sent before them. So even this famine, God had an answer for the famine before they even knew what the answer was. God was at work. He's putting this together for them. And doing this, God prepared this man. I read one uh, theologian who said this. He said, Joseph's life 
covers many years, but it paints one picture. A faithful, promise-making, promise-keeping God, mysterious in His ways, but ever mindful of His people, ever planning ahead for their good, ever meeting their needs. God is doing that. That's why even in your most difficult days, on the process of your journey with God, listen, even in your most difficult days, God is at work. He is sending a man ahead of you. He's getting things ready. He's putting things in order. You've got to remember that all the way. Look at his sufferings in verse 18. It says, they hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons. Now, I want to I you know, give you something here because in the original Hebrew, that's that really not good, good translation. The original Hebrew would say that last part. Instead of he was laid in irons, it would say his soul came into iron. It's the word nephesh for soul. Remember when God created man, Genesis 2, 7, and he said he breathed into him the breath of life and man became a living nephesh. That's the Hebrew, nephesh. Same word that's used here. Now what does that mean? That means this, that the pain of the chains that were on him did not just abraze his flesh. They went to the very existence of who he was. He was in incredible difficulty through these testings that he had all along the way there. Someone said, because they said, well, you don't know to say it. it should be translated, his soul entered the iron or the iron entered his soul. And it doesn't really matter, the meaning, because the, the holy man was so galled with fetters that it seemed as if his life had been given over to the sword. Whence it follows that the safety of his life was as hopeless as the restoration of a life to a dead body. He, he was dead. And boy, do you learn this about dreamology. Oh, learn this about dreamology. One of the essential tenets of dreaming with God is every God-given dream has to die a human death before it's fulfilled. You have to come to a place where you say it's impossible for this to happen. It's dead. And then God breathes life and fulfills it. And then God gets all the glory for, for doing that. It happens every time. He did this. It's a, very centered it and told here in these words exactly what he did. But then we come to that word. I love that word. It's just a preposition, but I love it. Until he's ironed them in his soul. He went through testings. He was a slave. He was accused of false things. He did, oh, he did all this stuff. And, and yet it all happened until. What I'm talking to you about today is how to be faithful until the until. How do you stay with God and not give up until that word until becomes a reality in your life? Because it says until the time that his word came to pass. I mean, the dream he had came to pass exactly as God said it. But when he was in the prison, when he was a slave, when all it didn't look like there was any chance of that ever happening. But it did until until. Now, I want to give you something real quick here today. Five, I call them dream stealers. You say, well, Pastor, I thought we were talking about prosperity. It's, it's, it is. God's promised us prosperity. But as we have learned, we go through some testing of the word and the promise that he's given over our life. And he's promised to prosper all of us. He's promised to bring us into that. But sometimes between what God's going to do it and God does do it, we go through some testing like he did here. And as it says in that, that scripture, until this word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested. So until you're until, you're going to be tested by the word. Now, during that time, you're going to be tempted to give up. And there, there are many of them, but I picked out five, I think, of the, of the words that describe how the enemy steals your dream and locks you out from the prosperity that God wants to give you in your life. And here's what he does. Let me give them to you. Number one is disappointment. Disappointment. Proverbs 13 and verse 12 says this, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. Have you ever been disappointed? You know what we do as believers? We know God's at work. So when somebody disappoints us or a situation disappoints us, we immediately say, God, you've disappointed me. Now, most of us will never say that. But, you know, I find a lot of people that have lived with disappointment are just in their heart really accusing God of not coming through. It's amazing how we don't trust God, we don't pray, we don't, we don't give, we don't do all these things, and then we get in trouble and it's all God's fault. 
You know, somebody, I, heard, I think I heard Bill Johnson say this, and if I can remember it right, he said, some people only pray when they get in trouble, which guarantees the fact that they're always going to be in trouble. I'm going to say that again. I wish I'd have said that. But I'm, it was Bill, I know it was Bill Johnson heard say that. He said, he said that some people only pray when they get in trouble, which guarantees the fact that you're going to always be in trouble. <laughs> That's pretty profound if you think about it there. Disappointment. You know what disappointment does? Disappointment robs us of courage. It, it, it's the mother of depression when we get disappointed because life didn't turn out the way we wanted it to turn out. And the enemy uses that disappointment in our life to sideline us, to bring us to a place where we're not pursuing God anymore. We're not pursuing that dream anymore. We're just disappointed at what he hasn't done. You know, what you got to be careful about is that you pray about something and it doesn't happen exactly the way you want it to happen or it doesn't happen at all. And you get this disappointment that brings this whole spirit of offense with God and you get to that place like that and then you just... You know, you still attend church. You still, you still read. You know, you still do things, but you, you know, but you're not going anywhere because deep in your heart, you just think, well, God, did. and you quit dreaming. One of the biggest things that we do today, with all of these that I'm going to mention, is that we allow these things to bring us to a place where we won't try anymore because it hurt too much when we were disappointed when we tried it first. And sometimes it's just God strengthening our character and building us and preparing us for the awesome prosperity He wants to pour in our life. But we fail because we get so disappointed, we just stop. I got an answer to each one of these, and the answer really can apply to any of these, but the answer for disappointment is hope. It's hope. Romans 5.5, 5, listen to this. Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts, the King James says, the love of God's been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit that was given to us. Let me tell you something. Hope and disappointment cannot exist together. And the person with the most hope always has the most influence. The person that believes and is walking with God that even though everything's wrong, they still believe that he's going to do this and they speak hope because hope is in their heart. They know ultimately Jesus is coming back to this mad, crazy world. Jesus is going to win over all what the devil has tried to do to this world. Jesus is going to set up his kingdom. We know ultimately he wins and we believe that. And because we believe that, we can endure anything along the way because ultimately we win. With God. Disappointment's a biggie. Hope sets it off. Listen to this one. Loss. Wow. Loss comes in many different ways in our lives. We can lose a job. We can lose a career. We can lose our reputation. We can lose a loved one. Loss hurts. If you ever lost anything big like that, you know the pain of loss. You know, it's, it's a very difficult thing to go through. There are people right here today who have lost their spouse. And, and some of them I've done the funeral uh, for. And it's difficult when God doesn't heal and doesn't do it the way we want to do. I'm going to tell you something about loss. Loss gives you an opportunity to do something for God that you can never, ever do in all of eternity. You can only do it here. And that is the gift of praising him when you don't understand him. And loss gives you that ability to say God's good even though it don't look like it. <laughs> but I, I refuse to look at this even as bad and ter terrible to my heart it is. I still throw my hands up and say God you're good. And ultimately, when I get there and stand before you, I will never be able to point a finger in your face and say, you didn't do that right, God, because you do all things well according to your own purpose. It's a mystery sometimes walk with him, but he gives you that gift to do that. Can I, can I show you something real quick uh, over here in, uh, in Acts chapter 27? I, I started reading this yesterday. <laughs> I, I got so carried away reading this. Uh, Acts uh, you know, I preached through the book of Acts tw twice in my ministry, and I started in January, did it once here in uh, another church, and I went through Acts verse by verse. And by the time I got to November, it was time to get in the Christmas series, and I rushed through the last chapters of it because I was always so far behind trying to get through it. And I've read this story many times, but when I read the story, and it's the story of Paul's voyage to Rome. 
from he's arrested, hmm, another convicted felon that's on his way to die in Rome because he's been convicted of a crime he didn't commit. Anyway, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not being, I'm just, you know, it's just air. Our Lord was a convicted felon. Hmm, interesting, just interesting. Where'd that thought come from? You know, I don't know. I get rid of that thought. Anyway, 27 of Acts. Here they are going. Now, I'm going to tell you something about the book of Acts you learn real quick. You learn that we know Luke wrote the book of Acts. He wrote the Gospel of Luke, and then he wrote the book of Acts. And there's some passages in the book of Acts where, where he uses the word we, plural. And those are the times we know he was actually with Paul. Because he said, we did this. We went here and we did this and this happened to us and all of that. So they called the we passages. We know that Luke firsthand experienced something. This is one of the we passages. And what it is, he's convicted as a criminal. A centurion's in charge of getting him to Rome because he was a Roman citizen. and He's appealed to Rome. He's appealed to Caesar. And so they've got to get him to Rome. And God says, you're going to Rome. But the minute they get on the boat, what that story I told at the beginning, I, I love this. Uh, Verse 4 of Acts 27, when we had put to sea from there, we sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. They were trying to make it to Rome, but the winds were not helping them at all in the sailboat they were in. And Luke gives detail after detail after detail of where they were and what they did. It's just incredible. But as they're on this voyage, they are ready to make another leg of it, and Paul gets a word from God. And he says in verse 10, I perceive this voyage will end in disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but our lives. And the captain looked at him and said, you're a convicted criminal, and I'm not listening to you. I'm listening to my sailors, and my sailors say, let's go. And so they went. But guess what? God speaks through his servant, and they got into a wind. The wind was so bad it had a name. Verse 14, but not long after, a temp tempestuous headwind arose called Euroclidean. Like, what? It had a name. must be a demon. No, no it, it'd be like us today saying, as a matter of fact, the actual Greek words here means northeastern, a northeastern wind. Right, so what do we say sometimes today? A nor'easter's blowing in. And so it was a bad wind, and the ship was having all kinds of trouble. They began to throw things overboard. And, and listen to this. It got so bad. Can you imagine? This is a lot worse than my experience. Verse 20, Now when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest beat on us, all hope was that we would be saved were finally given up. I mean, for three days they didn't see stars or the sun. They, it was just storm for three whole days. So Paul starts telling them what they ought to do. And he said, you know what? You didn't listen to me, but you should have. But here's what I'm going to tell you. Last night, he says... Verse 23, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. You're going to Rome because God's ordained you're going to Rome. And matter of fact, God's going to give you everybody on this ship, 256 souls on that ship. And God's going to, so Paul goes out and says, hey, God spoke to me last night. And we're, none of us are going to die, but the ship's going to die. But we're not going to die. And they started finally listening to him. So they finally, of the long story of all the details, they finally get to this place and they run aground and everybody's jumping ship to, to swim into the, to, the, to the island or to the place that they'd run aground. And, and the, the prisoners that were on board, Paul was not the only prisoner, and they said, let's kill the prisoners because they'll escape. And the centurion guard and Paul said, no, i got to get him to Rome. We're not going to kill anybody. And so he, he did that. Earlier, some of the sailors, it was so bad, they tried to put the lifeboats down and escape. Well, this will preach. And the centurion saw it, and Paul saw it. Paul said, I just told y'all, if you stay with the ship, you'll be safe. Those guys are going to die if they go. And you know what the centurion did? He went over and cut the ropes. And the skiff, the, the lifeboat, whatever, flew, just floated away. They had no choice. Now they had to stay. And they were all saved. They all made it to the island. When they got to the island, and this is getting over into chapter uh, 27, 28, actually, when you get over that, they're on Malta, and they get shipwrecked there. Paul does some amazing things. The most notable citizen on that island had a father that was sick, and Paul, through the power of Jesus, healed him, and he was made well. 
But the great story in that is that Paul was sitting there one day around the fire, and he reached in the fire, and a, and a snake bit him. Now, there's a couple of snakes like this in the world. There's some of them in Amazon. And when th and they told me down the Amazon, they said, when this snake bites you, everybody just stands around and says, amazing grace, because you've got about five minutes, you're going to be dead. There's no hope for you. One pastor that I'm really good friends with down there, he was bit by that snake. And they all started singing Amazing Grace. And he cried out to God and said, God, if you'll heal me, I'll be a pal. I'll do what you've called me to do. And God healed him. He's got a big mark on his leg, but God healed him. And now he's serving as a pastor there in the jungle as he promised God that he would do. Well, that's the kind of snake bit Paul. All of them gathered around and said, oh, he's fixing to die. Paul just took the snake and flung it over there. And then when he lived, they said, he must be a God. You know, he can't, pat, he can't do that. And I, I love it. Paul said, looked at them, I'm not God, but I serve God. And the God I serve said, I'm going to Rome. And no snake's going to stop me when God says, I'm going to Rome. And I'm going to tell you something. When you experience the loss on the voyage of the journey to your fulfillment, I'm going to tell you, you're going to have some things like disappointment and loss come after you. But here's the good news. Listen, if God said that's going to happen, it's going to happen. And you can have courage, even in a snake bite and a, and a storm for three days on a, a boat that's falling apart. You, you, you can have that courage. If God said it, I choose to believe his word. But trust me, the word will test you until the word comes to pass. So you got to have some courage. That's the antidote here. Courage. Do what God said. I, I, I've got I to give you these other couple real quick so I can finish. Bitterness. Bitterness is just unresolved anger over the past. You know, bitterness is just something didn't work out for you, and you chose to, to nourish that hurt, and you, you get bitter. Bitterness is terrible. Uh, the, the Bible tells us it's, it's a work of the flesh that we're supposed to put away from us in Ephesians 4.31. Hebrews 12.15 says, Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up causing trouble, and by that many become defiled. The thing about bitterness, it will not only affect you, it will affect those around you. Always. And we all know this. We've seen it. And the temptation is so great. And what I'm telling you here today is, I'm giving you these, ste these, these dream stealers to know that if you're going to get to your prosperity, you've got to learn to nip it in the bud, as Andy, uh, Bernie Five says. You know, you gotta, you got to stop that before it can grow in your life and get you sidetracked from what God wants to bless you with. Bitterness. What's bitterness? Bitterness is the identity I have in Christ. I'm a child of God. I am not going to allow something that happened that didn't happen the way I wanted to happen. I'm not going to let it just eat me alive and, and rob me and be a thief to me from the enemy himself who will keep me from fulfilling. I'm going to reject that. I'm going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to have my faith in God, and I'm going to keep taking steps forward, and he is not going to take my praise away from me because something happened in my life. We've all got things that are worth sitting around and moping in bitterness the rest of our life over. But that's going to rob you from what God wants to do. The fourth one is jealousy. Jealousy. Numbers 5.14 says jealousy is a spirit. That's a demon. Jealousy is literally a spirit. It's also a, a work of the flesh that we're to, to, to in Galatians 5.19, when he lists the, 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 the works of the flesh that we're supposed to put away from our lives. Jealousy, just it's simple. It, in the spiritual context, it happens when a brother or sister gets something you've been praying for. That's a test. I've been praying and praying and praying for this. And then you get it. God, you missed. You know, why did he get it? I need it. I heard a story this week <laughs> of a, a lawyer telling a story. A guy up north. Bought, it was moving to a southern state. He was in a northern state. He was moving to a southern state. And he bought a car from a dealership before he came, and he financed it through the dealership. When he gets to the new state after a couple of months, he needs to get tags and licenses and all that, so you have to get the title transferred. Well, he was having all this trouble getting his title transferred. They were just running into all kinds of problems, and he, need, he couldn't get a tag without, you know, in the new state, in the southern state. Without, so he get, hires this lawyer. 
And the lawyer starts dealing with the state and saying, why don't we get a title? Of and they come to find out in the whole process of the thing, the dealership went out of business. And the guy got his title mailed not to the state to get retitled and back to, it went straight to him with a letter that said, this is such a mess, you don't owe anything, the car is yours, and here's the title. He got a free car. What? My first thought when I heard that, yay for him. No. Don't be spiritual, you wouldn't either. I heard that, I said, Lord, I need a car. Why can't I have some of that favor? Man, you know, that's, I mean, wow, he got a free car. Lord, I'd be telling that testimony. I'd be glorifying you, and I'd be going down the road and telling everybody how good you are. God, why'd you do it for him and not for me? Got to be careful about that thinking. Got to be real careful about that thinking because the devil will get a foothold in your life if you start thinking that way. Boy, one of the hardest things, you got to learn to rejoice with your brothers and sisters when they get a miracle that you've been praying for. You got you to you believe that. Listen, the last one is betrayal. Betrayal is a form of loss. You, you lose a, a friendship, you, you marriage, a, a business, sometimes because someone betrayed you in the process. All of these I've mentioned, aren't they horrible? This is life, isn't it? Loss and disappointment, and bitterness, and jealousies. And, you know, I'm talking about betrayal. Is there anything that hurts worse than being betrayed? I mean, it hurts. What do you do when you, when you get betrayed? You know, you, you know, you, here's, what, here's what our temptation is to do is tell everybody about it. Well, you need to know what he did to me. I did this for him, and he did this to me. And hell, he turned his back. He did blah, 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 blah. And that's just a road that nurses it. What you have to do is take it to the Lord. And you, you got to practice this thing called forgiveness. Real forgiveness. Real forgiveness. I have a brother in the Lord and we had, we're very close, and we had a, years, years ago, had a big disagreement. It was, a, it was a big one. And he eventually wrote me and said, I'm the worst friend you could ever have. Would you please forgive me? What are you going to do? You're going to forgive him. I'm going to tell you, the minute I chose to say that's forgiven, it's all gone out of my heart. I have nothing but love and respect and good friendship with him to this day. But you know what will happen a lot of times? Those around you that are closest to you can't figure out that. And they start taking the offense of another, and that's a big bad thing to do, to get offended over what's happened to somebody else. And that will happen a lot of times in marriages. Listen to this. I've seen this happen so many times. You get a husband and wife, and they get married. If you, you know, you're, you're teenagers, you get married, you're in love, and you know what? You, I'm going to pick on the woman, but it could be the man in this situation just as easy. But, you know, you have a fight, your first fight. You know, he squeezes the toothpaste in the middle, and you never squeeze the toothpaste in the middle. And you start fighting. Next thing you know, you're just really upset about everything, and you're saying things you should never say to each other. And finally, he gets mad and is tired of hearing it. And he says, I'm out of here. I shouldn't have married you anyway. And he slams the door, goes, gets in his truck, and drives off. And the wife makes a critical mistake. She calls mama. She calls mama. Mama, you ain't going to believe what this guy did to me. You're not going to believe. He did this, and he did this, and he even said it. He said he should have never married me. About that time you hear the truck pulling back in the driveway. She said, he's coming back. Hold on, I'll call you back. He comes in. He looks in her eyes. She looks in his eyes. And God gives two married people what only God can give two married people, this wonderful opportunity to forgive one another. It's the only way we make it. And you forgive each other, and you're kissing, and everything's fine. But mama don't forget. Now mama's involved. And mama hadn't forgiven. And now this animosity grows up and it causes a huge friction in the family. That's, that's this stuff right here. That's this, this, that stuff I'm talking about. And all of these are learning your identity in Christ, learning to forgive, learning to hope you know, in, in, in him. All of these things apply to all of these. You have to have the courage to say, I'm not going down that road. You have to have friends, brothers and sisters in Christ that have earned the right to speak in your life who love you enough to say, hey, I, you know, I just want to warn you, you, you're talking about this a lot, you're going, I know it hurt, but, you know, you need to get, you know, don't go down that road, don't go down that road. And, and 
if you do go down those roads, you got to come back. And you got to find that forgiveness. So you got to find that faith. You got to find that identity in Christ again. You got to you got to find that forgiveness. You got to come back to where you left, and you you got to get it right and get back on the journey to what God wants to do. Don't let the enemy do what Jesus said his nature is to do. He's a thief, and he's come forth to kill, steal, and destroy. And those are destroyers of your journey to prosperity, right there. And there's others, but I've mentioned these as big ones. And you've got to say no to them. Not going down that road. Hope for disappointment. Courage for loss. Identity in Christ for bitterness. Faith for jealousy. Forgiveness. Intimacy with the Lord for betrayal. Betrayal, let me tell you something. I wrote down first intimacy as the answer to that. Getting alone with God. Because the truth is, when somebody betrays you, nobody else is ever going to understand it. But God does, because why? The greatest betrayal in the whole history of the humanity took place against the Son of God. If you do a Google, do a, a, a search of, of the Bible and you search the word betrayal in the New Testament, every time it's mentioned, it's in re- reference to Judas and what he did to Jesus. So Jesus understands it. He understands it, and that's where the answer comes from. That that seems like a little negative, all these things I'm mentioning, but it's the enemy. I'm exposing him today so that you won't go down that path, and and we won't go down that path, and we'll journey to the fulfillment of what God's promised us, and we'll stay on that journey together, keeping our heart pure before him and keeping our faith strong and believing God that what he's promised, he's going to do. Yeah, I might have a shipwreck along the way. Yeah, I might have a snake bite me along the way. I might have some of these things that try to get me disappointed, and, and I might suffer some loss along the way, and all of these things. But if God said it, it's coming. It's coming. Be encouraged, my brother and sister, today. It's coming. It's coming. Until the until, be faithful. Let's pray together today. Father God, thank you for your word. It is powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts even between soul and spirit. It is so powerful. And Lord, I pray right here today that we hear this word, we receive this word, Some people need it for where they are right now. Some people know where they've been and how they got through it. Some people need it for what's coming. Because, Lord, you're going to test that that's valuable in our life. But, Lord, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. The good news is we are going to get there. But, Lord, the process. Help us to be faithful until the until. We love you, Lord, your grace, your your goodness to us, your love towards us shed abroad in our heart has given us a hope that is so strong and so great. We are thankful for it. Lord, I read that story in Acts 27 and the the captain wasn't in charge. You were in charge. And the man with the most hope on that ship garnered the attention of everybody. Lord, our hope Lord, gives you glory. Our hope and our firm belief in you gives us the witness of projecting how alive and true and real you are. And Lord, sometimes the journey is as important, if not more important, than the reception of the fulfillment in our life. Help us, O Lord, to do those things. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand up together today. Sing a song together today.